Coming up next on Amazing Facts Presents. You wanted to know about the millennium of prophecy? I think we are entering that time. Does any man know the day or the hour? No, but there's a lot of scriptures in the Bible that tell us about this pattern. Six days you work, one day you rest. For over 40 years, Amazing Facts has been dedicated to sharing God's Word through media. This program features highlights from some of our best television broadcasts. We invite you to sit back and enjoy this edition of Amazing Facts Presents. Our lesson tonight is one of the most important in the series. It's called The Coming King. And we're going to begin, as we do, with a historical that helps us to segue into our study, dealing with a young king, Joash, and how he came to the throne. It begins with a coup, a military coup. There was a very aggressive general by the name of Jehu. You ever heard the expression, someone says, he drove like Jehu. The uh, Bible says, evidently, he drove his chariot furiously. And in one day, he overthrew and he assassinated the kings of Israel and Judea. Well, when that happened, the mother of Ahaziah, the king of Judea, when she found out her son was dead, she was so jealous for power, she did not want one of her grandchildren to be coronated in her place, did something very ruthless. It's almost unimaginable. She executed all of her grandchildren. You know, uh, I used to believe one of the strongest earthly emotions was that love of a mother for her baby. Uh, the older I get, I find out that the love of a grandparent is pretty strong too. This lady, <laughs> this lady was very sick. You know who her mother was? You ever heard of Jezebel? The wicked queen of the northern kingdom. So she had a good teacher. And she killed all of the royal seed. She sent her soldiers before anyone could disobey her personal bodyguards in and had them butcher all of her son's children, her grandchildren. One of them managed to escape. The aunt of Joash and um, the nurse managed to take the little baby, he was one year old, and hide him in the temple of the Lord, where they kept him secured for seven years. That's a long time to go to church, isn't it? He was there actually six years. He stayed. He ended up being seven years old when he came out. Six years in the temple of the Lord, the high priest Jehoiada, who lived to be about 130 years of age, tutored him personally in how to be a good king and from the word of God. Finally, the time arrived when young Joash was about uh, seven years old. They decided it was time to uh, present him to the people. They couldn't keep him hidden forever. And the, uh, they got the soldiers, they notified them, they brought out the king's son, King David's heir, and they showed him to the people, and they said, set the soldiers about him, guard him. They blew the trumpets, and they anointed him as king. There in the temple of the Lord, he came out. Well, Athaliah heard all the noise, and she heard all the ruckus, and uh, she came in, and Jehoiada said, seize her, take her out, and execute her. The people rejoiced, the trumpets blew, Joash was surrounded with his armies, and he received his kingdom. She had ruled over the land six years. When he was seven years old, he took control of the kingdom. Now, that's a very important number that's going to appear. You know, the Bible tells us that our high priest is Jesus, and that he is in the heavenly temple right now. And soon he is coming out. He's at the right hand of the Father in the heavenly temple. He is soon coming out of that temple, and the Bible says he's going to receive a kingdom. You read in Revelation that when he comes, he is going to execute the mother of harlots and all the false religious systems of the world that have opposed him when he comes. That's the Athaliah, so to speak, that you find in the book of Revelation. And her daughters, the Jezebel and her daughters, and he will take the kingdom. Now, friends, I'm going to share with you something called the 7,000-year theory. And this may take a few moments to explain, but once you capture this, you've been wanting to know something about the eminence of Jesus coming, and this is going to give you that information. Here, let me peel out a few extra notes that I had. I told you the 
birth of Christ was about 2004 B.C., right? Creation, when you add up the ages in the Bible, I'm not going by the evolutionists and what they come up with. I'm saying if you just take the Bible in your hands and you start adding up the ages, it'll tell you Adam lived so long and he had Seth and Seth lived so many years and he had Enos. And it gives you the chronology and you can add all that up and get an idea of how old the earth is. It's often referred to as Bishop Usher's chronology. He was one of the first ones to do a very precise analysis of this. When you add up the ages in the Bible, it puts creation at approximately 4004 B.C. Now, if you've heard that date before, let me see your hands. I want some support here that I'm not the only one that's heard that date. It's just called Bishop Usher's Chronology. It's not any one denomination. It's accepted by most Bible scholars as a rough estimate for the time of creation. 2,000 years later, 2004 B.C., Abraham was born. You've got 2,000 years from the creation to Abraham. Then you've got 2,000 years from Abraham to Christ. And what time was Jesus born approximately? 4 B.C. Now, we don't know the exact date of his birth. I will tell you it was not December 25th. Don't get mad at me. But uh, we've got a lot of biblical support for that. You write down a question or you fax one in, and I'll give you the biblical evidence that Jesus was not born the 25th of December. Then we've got reason to believe that it's 2,000 years from Christ's first coming to his second coming. He came quietly the first time as a humble sacrifice, as our Savior. He's not coming quietly the next time. Now, this is called the 7,000-year theory. The reason for that is when you get to Revelation, it speaks of a 1,000 years when God's people live and reign with Christ. Do you see a pattern here? 2,000 years, God preaches the gospel through what we would call the patriarchs. See, we've got a little chart up here. 2,000 years, the age of Adam, the fathers, the patriarchs from 4,004 B.C. to about 2,004 B.C. Then you've got the age of the Jews, the Israelites. Abraham was born 2,004 B.C., and you've got that age until 4 B.C. Christ is born, and that would reach to approximately 1997, 1996. And some of you are saying, well, it seems like he's late. Stay with me. Then you've got, the Bible says there's a thousand years where we live and reign with Christ, a thousand years of rest. One thing I want to make exceedingly clear, Pastor Doug does not believe that anyone should be setting a date for the second coming of Christ. The Bible warns us against that. If I were you, I would avoid anybody who thinks they can pinpoint the day and the hour. Jesus does not want us to make our decisions to serve him based on a train schedule. It needs to be a heart commitment. But he does want us to know when the time is near. Now, there's a pattern that you see many times in the Bible. First of all, you've got 6,000 years here, then 1,000 years during the millennium. Some of you are saying, wait, Doug, uh, if we're exact about the year 4004 B.C., and it's not exact. We don't know. There's still some ambiguities in the chronology. Let me give you an example. The Bible says Noah lived 500 years, and he had Shem, Ham and Japheth, his three sons. It doesn't tell us when they were born in Noah's life. So there's a few years there we're not exactly sure of. So we can't put our finger on the date of creation, okay? Something else that you need to keep in mind is the Bible teaches very clearly that there is going to be an apparent delay just before Jesus comes back. How many of you remember the story in the Bible where Moses went up the mountain to get the Ten Commandments? Do you remember that? How, how long was he on the mountain? 40 days, right, and 40 nights. How long did he wait at the foot of the mountain before he went up? See, everyone knows the 40 days and 40 nights, but if you turn in your Bibles, you'll find out Moses waited at the base of the mountain six days. At the beginning of the seventh day, God called him up into the clouds. Is this starting to sound familiar? And Moses said to the people, I'm coming back, but he didn't tell them exactly when he was coming back. When he did come back, it says in Exodus when the people saw that Moses delayed, delayed coming down, where, where, we thought he was coming back, where'd he go? It's been so long. They lost heart, they made a golden calf, they broke all Ten Commandments in one wild party. But then he came. There was an apparent delay, but then he came. Jesus says in Matthew 24, if that evil servant says in his heart, my Lord delays his coming and begins to eat and drink with the, the lost and the drunken and live like the world, the master of that servant will come in a day he's not looking for him. 
He won't be ready. Some of you remember a parable in the Bible of the ten virgins. It says, when the bridegroom, that's talking about the coming of the Lord, while he tarried, they all went to sleep. Friends, I'll tell you, if there was ever a time in the history of the world when the church was snoring, you can hear it now. We're living in this era of delay. You can also read the prophecy in Habakkuk where it says, though it appears to tarry, it will come. We're living in that window now, is my, my belief, friends. Right on the very threshold, the Lord is between inhaling and exhaling, and the next main event in the prophetic schedule is the coming of the Lord. Now, there's a few things left to happen we'll cover in future lessons. But there's a pattern here. Now, let me give you some stories in the Bible. There was a law among the Jews that they were to farm their land for six years. The seventh year, they were to leave it fallow to help the soil to recover its virility. How many of you remember reading that? Six years, you farm it. Then the seventh year, it's dormant. You know, Jesus said, I'm the sower. The Word of God is the seed. For 6,000 years now, through the patriarchs and through the Hebrews and through spiritual Israel and the church, the seed of truth has been sown in the world. You know how Jesus is pictured coming in Revelation? With a sickle to harvest the earth. And then for 1,000 years, there's no more farming going on. There was another law that they had among the Jews that a Hebrew could have a servant among the Hebrews for six years. What happened at the end of six years? He was liberated. He was set free. How many of you remember the story? I told you about the Mount of Transfiguration. I think it was opening night where Jesus said to his apostles, some of you are standing here who will not, Mark chapter 9, read the whole first nine verses, some of you are standing here who will not taste of death until you see the kingdom of God come with power. After Jesus makes that statement, it says in the Bible, six days later, he took them up. Isn't that interesting? Matthew and Mark. Luke, who got it secondhand, he says about eight days later, because Luke was, you know, just uh, speculating. Matthew and Mark say distinctly six days later, he took them up. And what happened there? He was in the clouds. He was glorified as he will be when he comes. They were given a miniature picture of the second coming. I don't think we need to miss the point that the number six keeps appearing. When you read in Revelation about seven trumpets blowing, right? And after the seventh trumpet blows, Jesus comes and God's people are liberated. Joshua blew seven trumpets after they marched around. How many times did they march around the city of Jericho? Thirteen times. People always say seven times. They marched around the city one time for six days. Then on the seventh day, they marched again seven times. That's a total of 13, right? That adds up for one of, the 12 one of each of the 12 tribes and the tribe of Levi, in case you didn't realize that. And then they took possession of the promised land. Well, soon we're going to take possession of the promised land. The trumpets are going to blow. And all these patterns in the Bible are telling us that there could be some credibility to the 7,000-year theory, friends. You wanted to know about the millennium of prophecy? I think we are entering that time. Does any man know the day or the hour? No, but there's a lot of scriptures in the Bible that tell us about this pattern. Six days you work, one day you rest. 6,000 years now. Oh, incidentally... 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 8, a day with the Lord is as a thousand years and a thousand years as a day. Psalm 84, verse 10, a thousand years in his sight are as a day when it is past. And you've got uh, Psalms 90 also. There's several verses that say with the Lord a day is like a thousand years. For 6,000 years, Jesus has been working to redeem this world. The Bible says that during the millennium, it's a time of peace where we live and reign with the Lord. It's like a thousand-year Sabbath, you might say. The pattern is all through the Bible, friends. We are right now at the sundown of that last millennium. Don't pay attention to the year 2000 because the ADBC dating method, it's, it's not accurate. The Bible did not utilize that. But we do have signs, and we're going to cover some of those in our lesson. Let's go to question number one now. And uh, I have a lot to share with you tonight, and I want to make sure that I can get through the lesson. How many of you filled out your studies? Good for you. Did you learn some new things? You get an A+. Plus. We're going to double your wages for coming to this meeting. Now you can come free. How's that sound? <laughs> question number one. Who is the king who will emerge from the heavenly temple? Answer, and remember, you're supposed to say the answers with me. Revelation 14, 4, 
And I looked and behold a white cloud and upon the cloud one sat like the Son of Man having on his head a golden crown. You wanted to know who the Son of Man was there in Daniel 7. Well, right there in Revelation it tells us Jesus and he's coming to harvest the earth. One like the Son of Man is coming. Now we're going to spend the next few questions talking about not when Jesus is coming, but how Jesus is coming. And some of you are going to go, I don't want to know how he's coming, I want to know when. Friends, you need to know how. Let me tell you why. When Christ comes again, it's called the second coming. You know what that means? There was a first coming. When he came, when the Messiah, when God became a man 2,000 years ago to show us how to love each other, to show us the Father, to die as our sacrifice, that was his first coming. His own people, my people, had the scriptures. They had the prophecies about the Messiah and his coming. But did the majority of his people recognize him when he came the first time, or did they misunderstand the prophecies about his first coming so they were not prepared? Is there a chance that God's people with Bibles, with scriptures, could misunderstand the prophecies about his second coming? I'm going to promise you that the majority of the world will not be prepared because the Bible says so. Indeed, the majority of the church will not be prepared because we want it to happen a certain way, and if it doesn't fit in with our ideas, we don't accept it. We've got to find out what the Bible teaches, what the prophecies teach. Do you agree? So it's important to know how he's coming. Now that's one reason. So you're ready when he does come. The other reason is the Bible tells us that Satan is going to perform his masterpiece of deception. God came to earth in the form of man to save. The devil is arguing with the Almighty. He says, I need to have the right to come in the form of a man to share my viewpoints. The devil is going to come as his great crescendo performance and impersonate Jesus. And if you don't know how Jesus is coming, not just when, but how he's coming is even more important, you will be deceived. Because the Bible tells us that he will perform signs and wonders that will be so persuasive, so convincing that if it's possible, it will deceive even the very elect. That's why we've got to be rooted in the rock of his word or we will be washed away when the storm comes. So let's find out how Christ is coming. Question number two, will Jesus come quietly when he returns? No. The answer says, for the Lord, and this 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God. Trumpet was the loudest thing they had back then, that uh, man made noise, a shout and a trumpet. Jeremiah chapter 25, verse 30, the Lord shall roar from on high and utter his voice from his holy habitation. He shall mightily roar upon his habitation. He shall give a, a shout. It's talking about roar, shout, trumpet. That's not all. Psalms 50, verse 3. Our God shall come and shall not keep silent. It shall be very tempestuous. That means stormy round about him. Now, maybe I should pause right here before I offend anybody, make a little disclaimer, little statement. I have preached in literally hundreds of different churches with many different denominations, and I am pretty well acquainted with what the different beliefs are out there. One of my favorite things is I like to surf religious broadcasts Sunday morning on the TV or on the radio and listen to what's being taught out there. So I have a pretty good feel. And again, I want to restate, I believe God has spirit-filled people in many different churches, many different persuasions, people that love him that he loves, okay? And he's working in their lives. That doesn't mean I agree with all the teachings. There is a very popular teaching that I don't think is biblical that when the Lord comes that the rapture is going to be silent and secret. I don't find that in the Bible. Stay with me now and see what you find. If you disagree with me, let's be agreeable about it. Does that sound fair? We're here as friends to study the Word. If you have a question, say, wait, 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 what about this scripture, Doug? Write it down. I am not afraid. I promise I'll read any of these relevant questions and we will address them, okay? Does that sound fair enough? Do we agree to go by what the Bible says? Okay. Number three, what other physical evidence will accompany Jesus' return? It says, and there was a great earthquake, such as was not since men were upon the earth, so mighty an earthquake and so great. Revelation 16, 18. 
But do you realize that there have been five major earthquakes in the last two months over seven? Now the U.S. Geological Survey says we're not having any more major earthquakes than we normally have. The problem is now they're in populated places. Well, now if you were the Lord and you were trying to get mankind's attention, that's where you'd put them, right? You wouldn't put the earthquakes out in the middle of the ocean or, you know, in the North Pole. You'd put them where it would get people's attention. You know, Jesus said in Matthew 24, that is one of the signs of the last days. He said there will be earthquakes in diverse places. And people say, there have always been earthquakes. There were before Christ. It says it in the Old Testament. Jesus said there'll be wars and rumors of wars and plagues and earthquakes and natural disasters. But keep in mind, Christ, when he said that, he's talking about a confluence and a concentration of these things, a greater intensity. Now, I, I read a statistic that said that between 19, 1900 and 1960, there was typically one major earthquake every 10 years. From 1960 to the present, there are now between 8 and 10 major earthquakes every year. Does that sound like an increase to you? It does to me. And the natural disasters. Well, I'll get to that in just a minute. And so a mighty earthquake is another sign of the event. Number four, question number four. Who will see Jesus when he returns? Just a few people? You know, some churches say he came quietly already, and nobody saw it. Only special people with special glasses saw him come. It's not what the Bible teaches. Matthew chapter 24, verse 30. Then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with power and great glory. That great glory means brilliance. It's going to be something that nobody is going to miss. Go on here, and we'll read in Revelation chapter 1, verse 7. Behold, he comes with the clouds, and how many? Every eye. Every eye will see him. Now, somebody always asks me this question. I'm going to get it in advance. Doug, it's a round world. The world's round. How can every eye see him at the same time? It doesn't say at the same time. It says every eye will see him. And as the Lord sweeps around the circle of the earth and he vacuums up those that are ready, everybody's going to see him. And he'll take them back to glory, okay? It doesn't say they all see him simultaneously. Unless, of course, CNN has their cameras trained on the event when it takes place, and then maybe everyone will see it at the same time through satellite. Number five. Number five. Who will be with Jesus when he returns in the clouds? Is he coming back alone? No. Matthew 25, verse 31 tells us, When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the, how many? No, how many of them? All. all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit on the throne of his glory. Now think about this, friends. When Christ rose from the dead, one angel came and rolled away the stone, and the Bible tells us in the book of Matthew the glory, the brilliance, the charisma of that one angel made a hundred of the bravest Roman soldiers fall down in shock like dead men. And then they revived their senses and fled in terror from the presence. One angel. You know how many angels there are? Well, you've heard of guardian angels. How many people in the world now? Six billion. They say more than six billion now. And uh, we believe the Lord's got at least two good angels for every one evil angel. So let's say 12 billion. That's a conservative estimate. Can you imagine what it would be like if 12 billion angels filled the heavens? You think someone's going to say, hey, did you see the angels come yesterday? <laughs> no, it's not going not to be like that. All the holy angels. The Bible tells us in the Old Testament, one angel of the Lord went through the camp of the Assyrians and 185,000 soldiers were executed in one night from one angel. Number six, what will the brightness of Jesus coming do to the living wicked? Answer, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 7 and 8. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God. Now I want to pause right here for a second. The Bible says Christ left in the clouds and he's coming in the clouds. Those clouds, my friends, are not clouds of H2O vapor. They are clouds of angels. Light. The Bible says when he ascended to heaven, he was received up in these clouds, and it's clouds of light of angels. You need some proof text. You go to Revelation chapter 20, and it says, The wicked cover the earth like a cloud. 
the Old Testament writers and the New Testament writers sometimes talked of a crowd of people or a crowd of something as a cloud. And so the Lord was received up into these clouds of light, and they were angels. Stay tuned. We'll be right back after these important messages. When Christ comes again, it's called the second coming. You know what that means? There was a first coming. His own people, my people, had the scriptures. They had the prophecies about the Messiah and his coming. But did the majority of his people recognize him when he came the first time, or did they misunderstand the prophecies about his first coming so they were not prepared? Is there a chance that God's people, with Bibles, with scriptures, could misunderstand the prophecies about his second coming? If you've missed any of our Amazing Facts programs, visit our website at amazingfacts.org. There you'll find an archive of all our television and radio programs, including Amazing Facts Presents. One location, so many possibilities. Amazingfacts.org. A website whose roots date back to the beginning of time, sabbathtruth.com is the definitive resource for Bible light on the Lord's Day. Clear Bible answers for every question you've ever had about the Sabbath. Seven key topic headings guide you through the purpose of the Sabbath, which day is the Lord's Day, the Sabbath and prophecy, questions about the Sabbath, how to keep it holy, the Sabbath and history, and many Sabbath resources. Visit sabbathtruth.com today and share your newfound treasure with a friend. Friends, the Bible tells us that we have a spectacular homecoming to look forward to in the very near future. The scriptures clearly describe an awesome, earth-shaking event as Jesus returns to take his people home. For the saved, it'll be the most joyous occasion imaginable. For others, it will be terrifying. That's why God wants you to be ready for the day of the Lord. Yet there are many confusing and counterfeit teachings regarding how Jesus is coming. You can learn the truth about this phenomenal event in a book that we prepared for you. It's entitled, Ready or Not. You won't want to miss out on what this book reveals regarding what is really going to happen when Jesus returns. We'll send this amazing book to you for a donation of $20 or more. Please call the toll-free number on your screen and ask for offer number 1002. Or go to our website, it's amazingfacts.org. If you prefer, you can write us, Amazing Facts, offer 1002, P.O. Box 1058, Roseville, California, 95678. Well, time is up for this edition of Amazing Facts Presents. Until we meet again, remember, Jesus is the truth that will set you free. This is your opportunity to take advantage of this week's special offer. Just call the toll-free number on your screen and be sure to note the offer number when you make your request. You may also visit our website at amazingfacts.org. Thank you for watching Amazing Facts Presents.